Uh, I'm pleased to make the introductions today. Um, you have your recording notation there. I just hit got it and we can move on. I'm Steve Jones. I direct the Center for Cardiometabolic Science. Uh, we are a part of the uh, larger umbrella of the Division for Environmental Medicine. The Division of Environmental Medicine uh, is our home. Uh, it's our turn today uh, to have someone come and present, and who better than our presenter, uh, Dr. Collins, today. Uh, so we, by way of introduction, uh, Dr. Collins uh, earned her bachelor's degree uh, from University of Leicester. Uh, in 2006, she went on uh, in 2011 to earn a PhD from the same university, uh, where she was studying uh, uh, circadian rhythms in ventricular myocytes, specific, specifically the impact of uh, uh, diurnal variations in EC coupling. Uh, she then engaged in a, a deep postdoctoral fellowship at the UAB, where she uh, pursued further her interest in calcium handling, where she looked at the interplay between uh, certain metabolic signals and factors that regulate calcium handling in ventricular myocytes. We were fortunate, and along this way, of course, Keep in mind that she's been winning awards the whole time for her presentations, uh, abstract awards to attend conferences. Uh, we were fortunate enough to then uh, recruit her here in 2019. Um, she had the, the great personal professional fortune of coming here in October of 2019. So if you remember your COVID calendar, so she was uh, unboxing things and starting to find out which end is up uh, right about the time that everything shut down and came to a screeching halt. Uh, she was not deterred by this. Uh, she doubled her resolve and uh, worked even harder. Uh, this is, of course, uh, evidenced by the fact that she is a co-investigator on multiple NIH grants. Uh, she's a co-investigator with Drs. Carl and Hill, um, Nestoriak on their uh, e-cigarette toxicity grant. She's also a co-investigator uh, on a, a cardiometabolism grant with Dr. Hill and myself. Uh, all along this way, she's also been reviewing for every aspect of the American Heart Association. There's not a part of their portfolio she's not reviewed for. Uh, for the Department of Defense, she's reviewed for, uh, for a number of uh, universities pilot programs. And of course, she's also reviewed for uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, Center for Scientific Review, specifically for a uh, cardiac biology study section. Uh, all of this work uh, is not without the sort of pinnacle of award. Uh, she just published a, a tour de force uh, paper uh, just a couple of months ago. We'll be hearing a little bit about today. And uh, as of now, what still just on the order of weeks, maybe six, eight weeks ago, uh, she was awarded her first NIH grant as a PI. Uh, it's a $3 million grant to basically do what she's going to tell you about today. So without taking up any more of her time, it's my uh, privilege and honor uh, to introduce uh, my colleague, collaborator uh, in the center, Dr. Helen Collins. Thank you for that introduction, it's very kind. Okay. Um, so, as Dr. Jones alluded to, I'm Helen Collins, Assistant Professor in the Center for Cardiometabolic Science and the Environment Institute. And today I'll speak to you about um, some of the work that we've got going on in the lab right now, focused on understanding the mechanisms contributing to pregnancy induced cardiac growth. And um, other than these listed uh, funding sources on this slide, I have no additional disclosures to declare. So uh, for those of you who do not know me already, um, I just wanted to start the presentation by giving you a brief introduction into some of the research interests that we have in the lab um, and also the overall mission of uh, the Collins Lab. So the overall mission of the lab is to understand the mechanisms contributing to female cardiovascular health and resilience. And this is particularly important because historically in both uh, preclinical and clinical studies, females have often uh, not been included in those studies, and therefore there's a lack of knowledge of how of basic female cardiovascular biology, but also how uh, the female heart responds to stresses. So in the lab, um, we have a number of areas of investigation under this larger thematic focus. And of, um, as I alluded to on the previous slide, I'll discuss today mechanisms that contribute to pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. 
But we also have interest in uh, examining sex dependent changes in the heart with respect to the impact um, on the female heart uh, in terms of the remodeling that occurs after a myocardial infarction and the impact of changes in metabolism between the sexes. And also, um, hopefully, as a consequence of the studies I'll discuss today, um, we hope to, in the future, look at some models of uh, pregnancy-associated cardiovascular complications, such as peripartum cardiomyopathy, to um, branch into some translational angles from this basic science research that we have. So, um, as I alluded to, I'll discuss now um, some of the uh, mechanisms that contribute to pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. But first, I want to start by letting you know, if you go away from this presentation with only one thing learned, this is it, that pregnancy in the United States is very dangerous. So uh, you'll see this uh, schematic here. Um, this was um, data pertaining to maternal mortality rates in 2018. And you can see at the top of the list is the United States. And this uh, is in comparison to the rest of the developed and developing world in which the United States has the highest maternal mortality rates. And in 2018, these comprised of 17.4 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And, now, and more recently in 2020, these stats were updated and this is further increased to 23.8 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And it will, um, steadily increase if we don't address some of the fundamental uh, mechanisms contributing uh, to these high maternal mortality rates. So um, in terms of the United States, you'll see of this map of the 50 states that many of these states have very high maternal mortality rates. And these data uh, were obtained between uh, 2005 and 2014. And you'll see that um, uh, many of the states have very high uh, maternal mortality rates in, in comparison to the national averages. And you'll also notice that many of the Southern American states are those which have the highest maternal mortality rates. And I'd be remiss um, not to be in the state of Kentucky, not to mention the maternal mortality rates that we have here. And uh, it, between uh, the time period of this particular study between uh, 2005 and 2014, 13.5 uh, uh, maternal deaths per 100,000 life births were recorded. However, um, more recent uh, mortal mortality rates collected by the Kentucky Department for Public Health uh, suggest that this is for somewhat further increased. If you'll notice, if I, re I remind you again, from 2018 that the maternal mortality rate was 17.4 deaths per 100,000 live births. The Kentucky average for this same time period was 76 deaths per 100,000 live births, which is a significant increase um, above the national average. So it's clear that even in uh, the home state of Kentucky, we have significant issues with maternal mortality rates. And in this same publication, it was noted that many of these deaths were actually preventable. 91% of these deaths were preventable. So um, it's clear that not only is uh, maternal health an uh, important area to examine, but that we can do a lot better in reducing the maternal mortality rates. So um, also uh, many of these maternal mortality rates are impacted by uh, uh, ethnicity and racial background. You'll notice from this schematic here that uh, black non-Hispanic women are three to four times more likely to have a maternal death in comparison to their white non-Hispanic and Hispanic uh, counterparts. So there's also a significant issue with respect to uh, racial disparities in maternal mortality rates. These, uh, many of the fact, uh, cardiovascular disease is one of the leading causes of maternal mortality rate. 
And this comprises of 15% of the uh, total deaths uh, during pregnancy. Um, of these cardiovascular diseases which occur during pregnancy, they're comprised of 29% of uh, arrhythmic uh, disorders and arrhythmia, 4% of coronary artery disease, 23% of pre-existing uh, cardiomyopathy, such as hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy, 24% um, uh, comprised of congenital abnormalities, and 16% uh, comprised of valvular um, uh, issues. And there's another 4% which is comprised of other pregnancy-associated cardiovascular complications, such as peripartum cardiomyopathy, hypertension, preeclampsia, and so forth. So it's important to know in the clinical um, arena that pregnancy itself has many cardiovascular um, consequences and adaptations which occur. And these are associated with some clinical symptoms. But at the same time, it's important to also note that um, during a cardiac pathology or pregnancy associated cardiovascular di uh, disease, uh, many of these um, symptoms are exacerbated uh, towards a pathological um, presenting cardiovascular clinical symptom. So many factors contribute to this increased risk uh, um, with respect to maternal mortality and cardiovascular pregnancy complications. Uh, one which has um, arisen over the last uh, decade is advanced maternal age. And this is due to many mothers choosing to have children later in life. And it, it itself is a significant risk factor for the development of um, pregnancy associated cardiovascular disease. In addition, having multiple um, births over a, a successive period or having a um, more than one uh, birth at one time is also uh, significantly correlated with um, increased cardiovascular risk during pregnancy. Uh, coming from the Enviro Institute, I have to mention some environmental exposures, uh, these such as uh, exposure to pollutants and also smoking and e-cigarette exposure have been associated with the development of maternal cardiovascular disease. In addition, I mentioned on the previous, uh, previous slide that uh, pre-existing hypertension and preeclampsia are significant risk factors for the development of maternal cardiovascular disease. In addition, um, obesity, poor nutrition, uh, pre-existing or gestational diabetes have all been shown to uh, contribute to maternal cardiovascular disease. Um, even surprisingly enough, having a C-section has been shown in terms of at least peripartum cardiomyopathy to have it be a significant risk factor for the development of that specific pregnancy associated cardiovascular complication. In addition, drug use and alcoholism during pregnancy um, also contributes. Uh, lactation itself, which is a normal physiological um, process that occurs uh, following the birth of the baby also um, it contributes. And this has been shown more so in the setting of peripartum cardiomyopathy, where um, the lactation hormone prolactin uh, has an anti-angiogenic anti form, which has um, been shown to contribute to issues there. And lastly, uh, infection and autoimmunity have been recognized as specific risk factors. Um, in terms of uh, the example of gestational diabetes, um, there are several environmental risk factors which contribute uh, to the development of uh, maternal cardiovascular risk, such as many of the other factors that I had mentioned, such as environmental exposures, physical environment, but also socioeconomic risk factors uh, contribute, and individual risk factors such, such as ethnicity, genetics, uh, prenatal exposures, and so on. But these, all these risk factors and the development of gestational diabetes have both short-term and long-term implications. And this is not only on the mother, but also the long-term cardiovascular health of the offspring.
which is uh, something my colleague Clara Sears uh, looks at, and she'll be um, probably speaking to you about that in a future grand rounds. And so um, in terms of short term complications, uh, most of those are uh, maternal, uh, neonatal, and uh, those which occur during delivery. And many of the long term issues uh, of uh, any pregnancy associated cardiovascular disease um, have significant long term implications of, for not only the mom, but also the child in terms of cardiometabolic health. So uh, there is a significant need for an increased awareness of maternal cardiovascular disease. And this can only be done through increasing the awareness among healthcare providers and also the public. Also improving access to healthcare and also improving pre and postnatal care. And then obviously the consideration of some of the uh, chronic health conditions such as um, cardiomyopathy and some of the other uh, maternal uh, cardiovascular complications that I've mentioned previously. And then we have a desperate need to tackle some of the racial and socioeconomic disparities that exist uh, with respect to maternal health care. And then ultimately for um, long-term benefit, early detection and timely intervention is crucial. And so uh, in order to do this, we need a multidisciplinary um, management of maternal cardiovascular disease. So for pregnant women with both pre-existing cardiovascular disease or disease which arises during pregnancy, we need, we need a multidisciplinary team comprised of obstetricians, cardiologists, and other cardio-obstetric staff who can provide individualized management plans. And also uh, as a result of this significant need and the maternal mortality rates no in Kentucky, we at the Enviro are um, in discussions to begin uh, planning a maternal uh, cardiovascular health center here to address some of the uh, need in, uh, in the community, but also to try to act, tackle these maternal mortality rates head on. Um, also for women that develop cardiovascular disease during pregnancy, there's a uh, essential need to develop a panel of effective biomarkers um, because um, there are some that already exist. However, um, these have not uh, proven effective so far. And so if we can identify at-risk populations of pregnant individuals, then we can um, uh, intervene earlier in the process and potentially reduce any long-term risk of cardiovascular disease. And so I had mentioned previously, there's some long-term consequences of pregnancy-associated cardiovascular diseases. And um, it's become clear in the literature over the years that not only does this affect the long-term health of the offspring, but um, any mother who has a, a pregnancy-associated cardiovascular complication um, is a significant risk of um, succumbing to a cardiovascular mortality later in life. So it's important for us to study um, these mechanisms and address these uh, issues with maternal mortality rates. But in order for us to first tackle that, we need to understand the basic biology of the heart um, during pregnancy and the cardiovascular adaptations which occur. So um, that's uh, so now I'll speak to you about some of these changes that occur during a normal pregnancy. So as you may be aware, during pregnancy, there are significant changes which occur in the cardiovascular system. And these are comprised of increases in cardiac output, increases in blood volume, reductions in total peripheral resistance, changes in blood pressure, and enlargement of the heart. And this enlargement of the heart is a physiological cardiac growth that's known to occur during pregnancy. And it differs from pathological growth because cardiac function is normal. And in some cases it's depressed in late pregnancy, but for the most part it's normal. Um, it's fully reversible. There's minimal fetal gene induction and fibrosis. Um, and this is unlike uh, pathological hypertrophy as shown here. And although these two types of uh, hypertrophy have similar signaling mechanisms associated with them, they differ substantially. 
So there's been several proposed mechanisms that um, contribute to this pregnancy associated cardiovascular growth. And I'd be remiss to not uh, bring out hormonal changes. There's significant changes in estrogen, progesterone, HCG, and prolactin during various stages of pregnancy, which all have significant impacts on the cardiovascular system. Uh, there's mechanical stress imposed on the heart through uh, this causes a release of growth factors and cytokines, which contributes to uh, hypertrophy. There's also increased cardiac workload um, through volume overload or hypervolemia, and then the increase in cardiac output to meet the uh, maternal and fetal demands. And then there's also nutritional factors um, which um, could play a role. But despite these known factors, uh, little is known about the specific molecular mechanisms that contribute to pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. So in, I'll now describe some of the published studies that Dr. Jones alluded to in his introduction. And uh, we recently published in AJP Heart a uh, catalog of the changes that occur in the maternal heart during pregnancy and during the postpartum period. And so um, this was basically an integrated analysis of the cardiac transcriptome, proteome, and metabolome during pregnancy and postpartum. So in order to do this, we took 12-week-old FEB NJ mice, and we examined four specific time points. Uh, this consisted of a non-pregnant uh, group, um, a mid-pregnant group, which is day eight of pregnancy. The mouse has an average gestational length of around 21 days. Um, there's also a late pregnant group, which is day 16 of pregnancy. And we also looked at the uh, dams one week post-birth. And it's not surprising that we see an increase in body weight during pregnancy, which peaks at late pregnancy, which is the point of maximal fetal growth. We also see at all stages of pregnancy and post-birth that uh, there's a significant increase in heart weight and heart weight to tibia length, which suggests uh, cardiac growth is occurring um, in these mice. Uh, in addition, we uh, see um, with respect to some of the predefined criteria for physiological hypertrophy, we also do not see any um, changes in cardiac function as evidenced here by the ejection fraction, which we do not see change during pregnancy or post-birth. However, we do see um, significant changes in the uh, chamber dimensions of the heart, in, uh, specifically the left ventricular end diastolic and the end systolic volumes. And we also see an increase in cardiac output, which is not surprising. Um, and this in our model is mediated primarily through changes in stroke volume rather than uh, heart rate. Uh, also in line with some of this, uh, the predetermined criteria for physiological hypertrophy, we also do not see any changes in the ex transcript expression of uh, genes associated with the uh, fetal gene program, such as AMP, BMP, and uh, myosin heavy chain 7. And also, we do not see any significant changes in um, fibrosis uh, during pregnancy and post-birth. So we, um, having established a, a model for cardiac growth during pregnancy, we next asked what the specific molecular mechanisms contributing to this pregnancy-induced cardiac growth were. So we know uh, uh, systemically, there are significant changes in metabolism that occur during pregnancy and post-birth. Also, there's a, a significant um, understanding that there's uh, changes in metabolism in the heart that also occur during pregnancy, in that we see a reduction in glucose catabolism, an increase in fatty acid catabolism, and an increase in ketone body catabolism. And uh, there's been some recent studies that have uh, alluded to this decrease in uh, glucose catabolism in the heart during pregnancy. These studies here on the right from uh, Zoltan Arani's lab show that PDK4, which is the inhibitor of uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, is significantly increased in late pregnant hearts. Um, 
They also found uh, consistent with this that there was an increase in the phosphorylation of PDH at the same time point. Um, and then through a series of studies, they found that this specific increase in PDK4 at late pregnancy was due to an increase in the pregnancy hormone progesterone. And through a series of additional studies in this paper, they found that when we inhibited PDK4 at late pregnancy, this inhibited cardiac growth, which was suggestive that a reduction in glucose oxidation was in fact important for cardiac growth. So we uh, first uh, looked at, in our four time points, uh, the transcript time, which is basically the genes in the heart and we looked at uh, the, the pregnancy associated uh, changes in these transcripts during the R4 time points of investigation. And we basically, I'm going to summarize this slide very quickly about what we actually did see because um, this heat map uh, is just blocks of color for everyone, it may be hard to see, but um, we found that with mid-pregnancy, we have an increase in transcripts associated with uh, angiogenesis and the vascular endothelial cell compartment. During late pregnancy, we saw an trans increase in transcripts associated with cardiovascular metabolism. And in fact, we also saw that PDK4, which I mentioned on the previous slide, is also increased in our um, parts at late, uh, mouse hearts at late pregnancy which it corroborates those uh, previous studies. Um, and then in terms of post-birth, we see uh, increases in transcripts associated with both the extracellular matrix and fibroblast cell types. So um, we next went on to um, confirm at the protein level, some of the uh, transcript expression uh, changes that we observed in metabolic transcripts at late pregnancy. And we found that at the protein level through immunoblotting, uh, that we find that consistent with our transcript data that uh, during late pregnancy, PDK4 is significantly increased. We also see that there's a decrease in the uh, phosphorylation and thereby activity of uh, PFK2 at the uh, same time point. Together, these data um, are indicative of uh, a reduction in glucose uh, catabolism at this time point. Also at the transcript level, we found significant changes in the ketone body enzyme, beta hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase one. And uh, we also confirmed that at the protein level and found that during all stages of pregnancy and post-birth, the um, expression of BDH1 was significantly increased. So what we think is happening is that um, a reduction of glucose catabolism at the level of both PFK and PDH is forcing uh, this glucose uh, into pathways such as uh, the, uh, the GLP pathway and uh, other pathways here to um, produce building blocks necessary to facilitate the cardiac growth we see during pregnancy. In addition, uh, whilst this glucose is being diverted away from entering uh, other, the downstream uh, metabolism, uh, we believe that uh, during this time, ketone bodies through BDH1 are maintaining metabolism to um, fuel the maternal heart. So then we next decided to investigate this further by looking at the metabolome of the maternal heart during pregnancy and post-birth. And you'll see uh, uh, another heat map here, which I'll explain to you. And we see that uh, during non-pregnant and mid-pregnancy, there's relatively um, little change in the uh, cardiac metabolome uh, as evidenced uh, here. However, we see the bulk of the uh, metabolomic changes in the heart during late pregnancy and post-birth where we see the increase in cardiac size. And also I have to uh, refer you to that red is high abundance of that specific metabolite and blue is low abundance. So during late pregnancy, we see the significant changes in metabolites associated with amino acid metabolism. These are also, this is an important um, 
metabolic pathways that contribute to uh, some of the uh, pathways that uh, contribute to the uh, building blocks that we need for cardiac growth. And here we see there's significant changes in um, the urea cycle um, metabolites. Um, and we did see that we had a significant increase in late pregnancy hearts of this a urea cycle associated metabolite homoarginine, which I'll touch on at the end. But we also saw several other amino acid uh, metabolites um, increased in the late pregnant hearts. In addition, we see that there's significant increase in metabolites associated with fatty acid metabolism, such as sphingomyelins and long chain fatty acids. Moving on to the post-birth time point, we see um, once again, um, some of the same changes that we see or persisting changes uh, that we see at uh, late pregnancy in that we see once again, that there's a significant increase in uh, metabolites associated with amino acid metabolism. Um, once again, the urea cycle, but polyamine metabolism and polyamine metabolites have been associated with um, cardiac growth in the literature. Also, um, we see a significant increase in metabolites associated with nucleotide metabolism and also glycerophospholipid metabolism. And together, all three of these uh, metabolite groups are those which are essential. Um, to provide the building blocks for, to facilitate cardiac growth. So what I've shown so far is that with mid-pregnancy, we have an increase in the heart size, which is associated with increases in BDH1 expression. By late pregnancy, the heart is further enlarged, and this is associated with a reduction in glucose catabolism mediated through increase in PDK4 and a reduction in uh, PFK2 phosphorylation, and also a sustained increase in BDH1 expression. At post-birth, uh, the heart is still enlarged, but we, see, we begin to see a reduction in PDK4 uh, levels, hinting at uh, the beginnings of the reversal of hypertrophy, but a sustained increase in BDH1 expression. And then both of these time points associated with the largest um, levels of cardiac growth are associated with increase in the uh, abundance of uh, metabolites associated with cardiac growth, amino acids, glycerophospholipids, and nucleotides. So um, you'll notice that there's this increase in BDH1 throughout uh, pregnancy and post-birth. And what's interesting to us is that this seems to follow the arc of cardiac growth that we observe in the maternal heart. So we do know that ketone body metabolism is important uh, during pregnancy. It's been shown that in various uh, uh, mammalian, um, uh, mammalian systems that uh, there's an increase during late pregnancy in the circulating levels of ketone bodies, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and also acetoacetate. And these are, these are produced in the liver, and they are uh, then used by non-hepatic uh, tissues uh, and are oxidized um, uh, for entry into uh, the t eventual entry into the TCA cycle. And so uh, they also have several um, non oxidative signaling roles, which are coming to light within recent years, um, which could also uh, play a role in pregnancy uh, uh, adaptations. However, in terms of the heart, the role of ketone body metabolism during pregnancy is relatively unknown. There's a body of evidence that does suggest that ketone body metabolism contributes to met metabolic remodeling in the heart. And there's been several papers from Dan Kelly's lab um, that suggest that uh, during heart failure, at least, that the heart can utilize beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the predominant ketone body, 
as a metabolic stress offense. And uh, they have also uh, used, interrogated the um, BDH1 enzyme through a mouse model of a cardiomyocyte specific knockout um, to gain um, evidence uh, to suggest this. And then also um, models of cardiac specific BDH1 overexpression have been shown to be protective against oxidative stress and adverse remodeling during pressure overload hypertrophy. In addition, um, studies which have um, removed the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier from the, the uh, cardiomyocyte of the heart have uh, noticed, noted that um, the application or provision of a ketogenic diet reverses some of the pathological changes seen um, within that knockout model. So these data suggest that a ketone body metabolism in the heart um, could have a significant impact um, on responses to stress. Um, so that is what uh, my grant is focused on. Uh, so uh, we uh, recently submitted at R01 and got funded. And so this focuses on ketone body metabolism um, during pregnancy with the overarching hypothesis that ketone bodies regulate pregnancy-induced cardiac growth and that changes in cardiac ketone body oxidation influence cardiac remodeling uh, during and after pregnancy. So um, in order to uh, facilitate this grant, we have uh, AIM-1, which looks at the impact of circulating levels of uh, ketone bodies and uh, the influence they have on cardiac remodeling uh, during pregnancy. And for that, we'll utilize a liver-specific BDH1 knockout mouse in order to address that AIM. In AIM-2, we'll look at the oxidation of ketone bodies in the heart and we'll do this using a cardiomyocyte specific BDH1 knockout mouse model to address whether um, the cardiac oxidation of ketone bodies plays a role in uh, pregnancy associated cardiac growth. And then in AIM3, we'll look at whether ketone body metabolism plays a role in the reversal of pregnancy hyp uh, induced hypertrophy. And so hopefully, if I get the opportunity to uh, come back in the future to speak to you, I will be able to speak to you on some of the findings of this um, specific grant. But for now, um, I want to just briefly touch on some of the um, timelines associated with um, pregnancy as uh, induced cardiac growth and when it may reverse. So. Um, it's been shown in many animal models um, that following pregnancy, uh, there's a decrease or reversal of uh, pregnancy associated cardiovascular growth. Um, and in as much as even uh, in the rat model in day uh, zero and day 14 postpartum, it seems as though the heart the LV mass is significant uh, significantly reduced in comparison to pregnant mice and is at similar levels to that observed in non-pregnant uh, rats. In addition, a similar study has been performed uh, with mice and they find within one week after birth, there's a significant reduction in heart weight and in body weight. And uh, so these studies suggest that within a one to two week period that the at least the rodent heart um, returns to a uh, pre-pregnant uh, like state. There's literature that suggests that um, in terms of the human uh, female heart that this does um, return to a somewhat close to a non-pregnant like state. Um, however, this is intimately tied with um, the reversal of some of the hemodynamic changes which occurred during pregnancy in the heart, but also um, are impacted by how the duration of lactation. In these animal studies, there's, a, there's not a clearly uh, defined um, statement to uh, declare whether these dams were actually allowed to lactate. 
And this becomes important when we look at some of our data in the lab because um, we had we find that like lactation itself has has a profound effect on pregnancy induced cardiac remodeling. So um, revisiting some of our uh, groups again, we have the non-pregnant, mid-pregnant, late pregnant and post-birth, but our post-birth groups up until now have always been allowed to lactate during those seven days post-birth. Uh, in the setting of this study, we included an additional group, which we refer to as a post-birth non-lactation group, which is um, similar to this post-birth group. However, within um, uh, hours of giving birth to the litters, the uh, litters are removed from the dam. And uh, this seems in our hands to have a profound effect on the mice. So we see, um, similar to some of the previously discussed data that we see this increase in body weight during pregnancy, peaking at late pregnancy. And we also see uh, the beginnings of a decline during post-birth, but the post-birth mice still stay uh, somewhat bigger. However, when we um, remove the litter in this post-birth non-lactation group, we see a significant reduction in body weight. In terms of the heart, we see during pregnancy and post-birth, the heart size increases as we've previously seen, but that we, when you remove the litter in uh, the post-birth group, we see a significant uh, uh, reduction in heart weight to tibia length it, at a similar level um, on average to that what we observed during late pregnancy. So um, we wanted to take this a little bit further and look at how uh, lactation and uh, first to look at how lactation uh, um, affects uh, long term changes, but also to uh, gain an insight as to when pregnancy uh, induced cardiac growth uh, resolves. So this is a little bit more of a complicated uh, study design, but we have non-pregnant mice, and then we have our groups which were allowed to lactate at one week, three weeks, and six weeks, and then we have comparable uh, control groups uh, in terms of the post-birth non-lactation. And then what I have to note is that at three weeks, we have to wean the letters, so these uh, post-birth, uh, six-week post-birth group have three weeks lactating, three weeks non-lactating. So we also see that uh, one week, um, similar to our other data, that the, the uh, post-birth mice are significantly enlarged in comparison to post-birth non-lactating mice. And these changes seem in body weight, at least seem to, um, between these two groups, seem to resolve um, by the three week time point. However, mice stay significantly enlarged in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the comparison to non-pregnant mice, which is represented by this dotted line. Uh, in terms of um, heart weight, we do see that between the post-birth and post-birth non-lactating groups, we see again this difference uh, with a reduction in heart weight in the non-lactating group. And this uh, remains the case also at three weeks whilst the, these post-birth mice are still lactating. However, um, by the six week time point, when lactation is no longer present in either group, uh, there's no significant difference between these two groups here, which suggests that lactation has a pro-hypertrophic effect. But also what's interesting about this specific time point is that even by six weeks postpartum, we don't see a um, return of heart weight to a non-pregnant like state. So um, future studies in the lab are going to investigate this timeline in more detail, but a recent paper um, was published in um, uh, human uh, women that um, the reversal of hypertrophy might not necessarily occur or go back to um, it does occur, sorry. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily go back to a non-pregnant like state and that these females have a new, uh, a new normal in terms of their heart size. So that would be something that we are very interested in to look at. So um, as going back to our summary schematic, um, 
this is where we stopped at the first part. And so um, going to six weeks post birth, um, we see that the lactation has a significant effect on heart size. And in some data that I haven't shown, we also see um, th this could be due to some changes again in cardiac PDK4 and BDH1, but we're still actively investigating this. And also it could be um, that some of the genes or markers associated with cardiac atrophy could be activated during this uh, time point. But these are questions that we need to address moving forward. So hopefully I've shown today um, in terms of our, our lab's data that pregnancy-induced cardiac growth involves the coordination of several metabolic pathways. But many unanswered questions still remain. So we um, don't really know the contribution of ketone bodies to this pregnancy-induced cardiac remodeling, but we should do soon when um, we fulfill the aims of the R01 grant that we have. But we also don't know how they may contribute to pregnancy-associated cardiovascular complications, such as peripartum cardiomyopathy. And as I also alluded to in the metabolomics data set, we see an increase in homoarginine. And this in the heart failure community has been, decreased levels in homoarginine have been associated with cardiovascular disease. So it could be that we could um, interrogate uh, homoarginine in a little bit more detail, and it could be one of the uh, biomarkers that we could go after in this uh, setting. In addition, um, we don't know the extent to which uh, other cell compartments and tissues play a role. We know that pregnancy is a systemic, um, it, it affects the whole systemic uh, physiology, and that's not just um, for the heart, as many other organs of the body, but also our transcriptomics data suggests that there's different uh, changes in different cells cell compartments with the mid-pregnancy being associated with the vascular endothelial compartment, late pregnancy being associated with cardiomyocyte metabolism, and post-birth being associated with uh, extracellular matrix and fibroblast markers. So that's something that we also hope to investigate moving forward. And then, as I briefly alluded to, um, the full impact of the circulating hormones, but also the placenta and the full extent of the maternal fetal interactions which uh, occur um, is not really known in uh, terms of pregnancy associated cardiovascular remodeling. So we need to look at the full impact of those. And then we need to investigate the nature of the hypertrophy that we see during pregnancy and also the impact of successive pregnancies on pregnancy associated cardiovascular growth. And also in terms of the clinical scenario, we need, we need to do better. We need to decrease those maternal mortality rates. And um, I'd like to thank my faculty mentors in the Center for Cardiometabolic Science and the Envirome Institute. Also members of the Hill and Jones Labs and my own lab. Also the Imaging and Physiology Corps for their assistance with um, the echocardiography and uh, some of the histological experiments that we performed. Uh, pa Paul Lokovic for uh, mass spectrometry, um, the Kentucky Embray Core for help with the transcriptomics analysis, other members of the center and my, also my external um, R01 collaborators, uh, Zolta Rainey, Peter Crawford and Dan Kelly, which are powerhouses in the ketone body metabolism field. And also um, funding, uh, funding sources for which this work would not uh, be possible if we did not have. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming he here and tuning in online. And I'd like to take any questions, comments, or suggestions you may have. And here's my contact information should you wish to follow up. So I'm curious if you could speculate when you think you have to share your role. I guess like the is like during pregnancy itself, you could say, oh, you know, we have 
maybe needs a pump more blood, you know, larger stop that's uh, volume. But especially the changes you see during lactation and the slower resolution of some of those changes, do you think that's as a physiologic benefit in some way, or do you think that's a consequence of the change in metabolism that has to, you're fighting the baby in a sense for glucose or it needs to force your tendons? That's a good question. Um, I think it's probably somewhat a combination of things. Um, I you think. Know, most people, oh. Most people actually want to repeat the question. The question was what was the evolutionary benefit of this uh, pregnancy associated cardiovascular growth? And the uh, slower changes, slower back changes to back to normal with lactation. So, um, in terms of uh, the uh, metabolic changes, uh, I think it's known that lactation is very. Uh, energy demanding process um, and that will also uh, increase the uh, sorry my ears increase the uh, cardiac workload and so uh, many of the studies uh, human studies which um, have been published um, they show that uh, many of uh, the heart resolves to a somewhat non-pregnant uh, state um, following birth, uh, but this, the preceding factor for this is the uh, change back in the uh, hemodynamic parameters which occur. So I think uh, during uh, pregnancy, uh, this must have, sorry, I, my ears popped, I can't <laughs> hear myself talking <laughs> properly. Uh, sorry. Um, so during pregnancy, these uh, resolve back uh, uh, following birth. And then um, I think because lactation is such an energy de demanding process, it, it, the strain still on the heart. And so the heart has to um, not only... Um, maintain the mother at that point but also we need the the volume is still increased um it needs to you can't just um go back to a normal size with the increased volume because that that physiologically wouldn't work um but i think the the metabolic changes that are occurring are significantly important and uh, I have a question about thinking back on that. Mm -hmm. If we think that some of these are compensatory beneficial effects, right? So we're pumping more blood and things like that. Do any of these studies show you try to intervene on this, you actually harm the child? So uh, in terms of the literature, um, well, there's not too much really known um, with respect to how the heart adapts during a normal pregnancy. However, there is a small body of literature um, which does suggest, and this is from several years ago, that in fact, ketone bodies, um, if you increase them significantly, they could have a, a deleterious impact on fetal growth and development. Um, however, a lot of these trials, there's a lot of um, issues with the rigor of the previous research in the um, the groups were not adequately powered and uh, there was uh, not really um, any predefined uh, criteria in terms of the time points investigated. So in terms of ketone bodies that can have a significant uh, impact, um, obviously there's been a taboo usually that when you, to have minimal uh, intervention during a normal pregnancy. Most of the intervention that occurs is during more of a complicated pregnancy. For example, in terms of ketone bodies, they're not even 
examined during a normal pregnancy. They're only examined during a diabetic pregnancy or pregnancies with complications. So I think that we need to increase um, uh, not only the knowledge of what occurs during um, pregnancy in the normal heart, but this will, if we do that, it will substantially impact some of the um, care that we give and the uh, treatment strategies that arise. I have one more question. Yeah, that's fine. So, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the graph showing that you're terrible at maternal mortality in the United States compared to others. Um, and that a lot of that is cardiovascular related or maybe hypertrophy or anything. Um, so, is there any data showing that, say, us compared to Norway or Sweden or some other country being much better than us? Um, that pregnant females have some of the same pathways involved that you're seeing happen in mouse models that are related to something that we do. So why would we be fourfold higher than the rest of the world? And if, if we are, is there something that we're doing related to these pathways? In terms of the um, specific signaling pathways. Um, so for those online, the question was, is there anything that um, we've observed in terms of changes in uh, physiology and signaling in the maternal heart, which um, can allude to differences in maternal mortality rates between the US and say other countries with um, reduced rates of maternal mortality. Um, so, In terms of the signaling that we show in our studies, um, now uh, in our studies, obviously, we're looking at the normal pregnant condition. And so um, some of the results that we've seen have been uh, corroborated at a basic science level by other investigators, such as the reduction in glucose um, catabolism being an important um, driver for cardiac growth. However, um, in terms of the clinical field, um, some of those uh, basic um, science findings have not really um, been looked at in much detail. Um, so that's what we hope to eventually do. Um, in terms of uh, some of the actual known signaling pathways for pregnancy-associated cardiovascular complications, um, there's a lot of convergence there um, between some of the underlying signaling, um, which uh, occurs, for example, during peripartum cardiomyopathy and also um, myocardial ischemia during pregnancy. There's a lot of the similar signaling pathways which contribute to those. For example, there's a decrease in both of um, the transcription factor STAT3 and also PGC1-alpha in both of those. So they are converging um, signaling mechanisms which contribute. However, they've not really been looked at. The only thing that's been looked at um, that I know of in terms of at least peripartum cardiomyopathy is that they have identified that there's a, um, uh, a cleaved form of prolactin, which is anti-angiogenic and uh, causes cardiac dysfunction and heart failure during pregnancy. And they found that if you block the release of that prolactin uh, via bromocryptine, uh, which is the only known treatment there, that that can contribute. But in terms of the direct uh, correlations between the basic and clinical world, they're just not there yet. I think Jason had a question. Just don't unmute and ask the question. Can you unmute and ask the question, please? Hey, Helen, great talk. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was just curious, when you were looking at the return back to your new normal after the pregnancy-induced hypertrophy, did you see that it was specific to a certain region of the heart, or was it just global uh, decrease in the entire heart? So... Um... Did you all hear that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we um, didn't look at any specific region of the heart. We just did um, in terms of uh, 
the gravimetric studies we obtained heart weight and heart weight to tibia length, we did actually um, do some histology to look at cardiomyocyte size. And um, I believe that um, that was still significantly increased from the uh, non-pregnant controls. So that's the depth of um, how far we've gone right now, but we hope to in the upcoming months go a little bit further. I think it's not just only the cardiomyocyte that's at play there though. I think it's um, several different cell um, compartments which, is, uh, which are contributing to the changes. Great, thank you. I'm curious about, it's really interesting in general that this glucose regulation and ketone regulation pathway has to be, you know, part of the stage part side. And I'm curious about what you think about the role of metabolic syndrome in general. We obviously know diabetes, once we get to that, you know, we're thinking about, okay, in the clinical world, those are the patients that are, you know, they have gestational diabetes, they're going to see the child field medical doctor. But maybe there's this whole category of pre-diabetic or not even quite as pre-diabetes, but other forms of metabolic syndrome. Are you thinking about the clinical applications of that? Do you think that there's this regulation in that pathway in that group of people? It seems like a hypothesis that you have. Um, so the question was, um, do we uh, think that some of the same metabolic changes are occurring with um, diabetes, gestational diabetes, and and in general, okay. metabolic syndrome. So and and metabolic syndrome. So as at the start of the presentation, um, I showed that um, both gestational diabetes and also pre-existing diabetes and also obesity, they're all significant risk factors for a plethora of maternal cardiovascular complications. I do believe um, that this is a good population of um, people to study. We can also study that in the lab. There's animal models of diabetes that we can employ to look at some of the underlying signaling changes that occur there. So um, that would be great for the future. I think that um, there's going to be some significant changes there in terms of ketone body metabolism because um, ketones go to a very high level um, sometimes during uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. So um, we, uh, th but then there's an interplay there with the glucose and the ketones that's known to occur. So I would like to look at some of the um, specific comorbidities moving forward so we can address some of those concerns um, and then hopefully put it into a translational model to one day help to reduce some of these maternal mortality rates and address some of the burden of those. But what I tell you what is interesting though, is that um, in terms of peripartum cardiomyopathy, it's not gestational diabetes that's the problem. It's actually uh, pre-existing diabetes, which um, would contributes to uh, the increased risk there. So there's also some uh, uh, significant modifications um, that are at play uh, in respect to a setting of chronic uh, diabetes, so. Thank you. I can come in with a question. 